So very good evening to all of you, and may I request Professor Devinder Singh to start with today's session. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome you all to this webinar by Natasha Mahatre. Uh, as you can see from the topic, uh, she'll be talking about uh, sound production and reception of sound, uh, and uh, I believe it will be more uh, related to uh, this phenomenon in the case of insects. Uh, but uh, I am very uh, uh, interestingly reading this uh, heading when she writes uh, uh, O. Henry story. So this person, O. Henry, uh, his uh, real name was William Sidney Porter. Uh, he wrote a lot of uh, short stories Probably he was writing one short story every week and he wrote them in hundreds. And an interesting point about his stories was that every story ended in some surprise. So we believe and we hope that Natasha's lecture will be ending in some surprise for us as far as knowledge about insects regarding their sound production and sound reception is concerned. So before we start this talk, I'll request uh, Dr. Bharti to introduce the speaker to the audience. Dr. Bharti, please. Yeah, thank you, sir. And uh, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Natasha Mahatre, who is currently based at Department of Biology, uh, Western University, Ontario, Canada. She did her PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Natasha has been postdoctoral fellow at University of Toronto, fellow of the College of Life Sciences, Berlin, Marie Curie Fellow and Postdoctoral Fellow at University of Bristol and Research Associate at Indian Institute of Science and University of Bristol. Her research focuses on how different animals, particularly in uh, invertebrates, perceive sounds, vibrations, and also aims to understand different mechanisms used by sensory systems to adapt to their ecological needs and to achieve high sensitivity. So with these words, please join me in welcoming Dr. Natasha Mahatre for today's talk. Thank you, Himeda. Uh, should I go ahead and share my yeah. screen? Yes. Thanks for that very warm welcome. Um, <laughs> it's my pleasure to be here. I hope, I hope uh, that the story will indeed have something of a surprise for everyone. <laughs> uh, so the O in O. Henry and you know, uh, is Ecanthus, and Ecanthus is a genus of crickets called tree crickets. And it's it, it was just a source of such a good pun that I couldn't resist calling it that. Um, and yes, indeed, I'm going to talk about how insects, these two insects, this insect rather, the male, makes sound, and how this insect, which is the female tree cricket, hears that sound and responds to uh, the cricket and how their sound production mechanism works uh, in order to sort of, how that's working within their mating system in a way that works for them. Uh, so let me, without much ado, get into it. Uh, tree crickets, the male calls, the way he makes a sound is he uses his four wings. The female hears this call, tracks the uh, male down, and uh, they copulate, he transfers his stomatica over to her. While she's, uh, after copulation, she feeds on a gland in the back of the male called the nuptial gland. And uh, the longer she feeds, the more sperm transfers into her. So it's a very fairly classic, beautiful mating system. And uh, what I'm interested in mainly is this, the part that happens before they meet. So, Let's have a look at mating systems very, very broadly, right? So imagine that this is some space in which males and females are distributed. Now, uh, insects lay their eggs, and once the eggs hatch, everybody disperses. So there's a fairly low density, usually, of uh, animals in the field. And what has to happen once these animals turn adult is that these animals have to meet each other to be able to mate and then produce the next generation. So let's for a moment imagine that this is the distribution of animals in the field. It could be more dense or less dense, depending on the animal. And the triangles are males, the uh, dots are females, 
the males can move a certain amount night after night and they're only active in the night so that's why i'm saying night and therefore they and so can the females and so this is sort of the probability that given any night that these animals would find each other now you can see that most animals in this case probably won't find each other and this is something that people worry about it's called the alley effect with the dilution effect so if um animals basically aren't really finding each other mating will be low and therefore the next generation will be low now this is an incredibly sort of simplified version of things right because it's a two dimensional space real life isn't two dimensional it's three dimensional and actually it's more complicated than even three dimensional right so topologically finding each other in some say bush like lots of trees lots of plants can be extremely complicated because let's imagine this surface as being part of some plant right now imagine that the male is on this surface and the female is on the top surface the male can walk around a really long time before he will ever find the female so you can be on either side of a leaf and never find each other so topology is really difficult and it means that mate finding can be an extremely challenging task and this is really where signaling comes in and this is one of the major reasons why animals signal which is that basically by making a signal they're extending themselves they're making themselves more conspicuous and making themselves larger and there are different ways to do this so you can make yourself larger by making a visual signal so fireflies for instance send out light which is more than just what they are they look like uh, other animals like moths make olfactory signals and the ones that you know to my mind anyway i'm biased i will admit this uh, are the most conspicuous are the animals that make sound because there's sort of advantages and disadvantages to all of these signals but they're basic the thing that they have to do is carry certain information main thing the main information they have to carry is who is the signal because animals need to be able to discriminate their own species from another species to be able to mate the second thing that they mount that signal should carry is the location of the signaler because if you don't know where the signaler is doesn't help you much in terms of finding that signaler you just know there is one and the last one if it's possible would be great is it tells the female at that very long distance how good that signal is is it actually worth her time or effort finding it and all of these signals uh can do that the thing about uh sound that is a little bit maybe better in some aspects is that sound doesn't need line of sight so i can hear something that i can't see even if it's occluded by a tree or some other thing in between that sound can travel uh to me anyway and i can find that sound and also sound has very strong directional information uh unlike say uh, olfaction right olfaction uh depends on the turbulence of air and you can lose a lot of information on where the signal is coming from in that uh signaling modality sound has some advantages in this case um so the question that i'm interested in is what's going on in this system which is the tree crickets is the system made so that the signaler is trying to make himself conspicuous and is the female trying to help him which is uh cooperate with him to try and make the signal more uh, obvious to her in order to mate find or is that signal a source of competition so is this cooperation or is this mate competition so are the males making an effort in some way to be loud and then also are the females who are the other part of this equation trying to make an effort to be sensitive so if you think about how sound transmits through space what happens is that uh, as sound transmits away from the signal producing element which will be the male in this case it decays it becomes softer and softer and this is you know perhaps uh, this is obvious to each of you if you sit in the back of the classroom you can't hear the teacher if you sit in the front they're much louder to you so if the female is more sensitive so if her hearing is in some way better tuned is amplified she will hear the male further and that would account as a form of cooperation 
with the female or uh, with the male and what you can say about the system then is this is where the two species are cooperating with each other and the main object of the signaling system is mate finding now if the female wasn't trying to be sensitive the, then you can say the main object of at least the female end of this signaling system is to assess the males so you want to really deal with finding the loudest male only the best will win so we want to ask the question of are these two animals doing that and the way i do that is i think about it in terms of the biophysics of the system so i'm going to start with the male end and then at some point i'll switch to the female end okay so are the males trying to be louder and one of the ways that we're going to think about this is by asking talking about this really beautiful behavior these animals do which is that they make themselves a tool and this tool is called a baffle hence the second pun in my talk which is baffling behavior um uh, so just a quick uh you know primer on how males sing uh crickets tree crickets included rub their wings together on the if you take a cross section through the part this part of the wing that they're rubbing together you will see on the back of one of the wings there are these pegs and what happens is there's a hard part on the other wing which strikes each of these pegs and as it strikes these pegs it sets both of the wings into vibration so if this is the wing the plane of vibration of these wings is in this manner and that's what produces the sound right and uh here are just some videos of what that looks like and hopefully you can hear the sound i'm not sure but that is a tree cricket singing and if you look using uh if you look at the wings using some method that i will introduce to you shortly you can measure what's happening in the wing that's being vibrated like that and what we can see is this wing moves the whole wing moves sort of in unison when it is vibrated at that frequency and it has what we call a resonance so that wing resonates at the frequency that this animal produces the sound and therefore it's low so the technique that i used to produce that picture that video that i just showed you is called laser doppler vibrometry it's a really really beautiful beautiful sensitive technique which works on lasers so what you do is you shine a laser on the object whose vibration you want to measure and when you do that that laser bounces off the object that's vibrating and uh the object that's vibrating doppler shifts the laser that's coming back the reflected uh light and what you can do is by mixing the two lights the outgoing light which is then reflected back and what the original light that you had you can actually back calculate how much the object was moving and the beauty of the system is it's incredibly incredibly sensitive so you know if you think about the wavelength of light it's a few hundred nanometers but you can use this method to measure things that are even smaller than nanometers so the noise floor of my system uh is a few picometers so that's 10 raised to the minus 12 and to give you kind of a physical um analog for what 10 raised to the minus 12 is but well, one thing is say a magnesium atom an atom of magnesium is 300 picometers and my noise floor is 5 picometers so you know this is subatomic and the beauty of this system is not just that we can measure things with the beauty of the the system is that you can produce sounds and you can hear sounds on the basis of motions that are subatomic and it's kind of remarkable that animals do this okay so basically what did we find using this very very complicated technique is that the uh, the wings of crickets tree crickets included are basically like tuning forks so if you hit them like you when you hit a tuning fork in your physics experiments they ring and they ring at the frequency that the sound uh that we hear coming out of the cricket wing is now the thing about resonances is what they basically mean is that input to output ratios are good 
So if you put in a certain amount of sum, how much you get out of it is uh, determined by the resonance. Uh, so over here, which is non-resonant frequency, the, in, the amplification or the input to output ratio would be low. If you look at it here, it would be low, but at the resonance, it would be high. So you get more for the effort you put in. And that's basically why these animals use this kind of system to produce sound. It's not the full story though. And the reason it's not the full story is that's one mechanism to or to make yourself loud, but you're still stuck with this problem is that you're not big enough. So being big is very, very important, right? So if you're gonna produce sound at any of the frequencies, you really want to be larger than these two lines over there at producing sound. And almost all insects that we know of simply aren't larger than this line. So what is it? What is it that's special about this line? Why is it that you need to be bigger than this line? So what happens? Let's look a little bit more closely at the physics of what happens when you make sound. Swing is vibrating back and forth, and it may, it pushes the air when it vibrates forward. It pushes the air in front of it forward, and the air behind it it rarefies, and then in the opposite direction again. So here, this picture is showing you what that looks like. The problem is the wing is only this big. What happens at the edges? At the edges, the high pressure that we produce in the front of the wing and the low pressure that we produce in the back of the wing meet each other. And you remember what happens when opposite sounds meet each other, opposite phase sounds meet each other, they, the peaks and the troughs in your wave meet each other, is they cancel out, right? So right at the edge of all the wing, is what we call acoustic sharp circuiting. The circuit cancels each, the acoustic circuit cancels each other out. Now this is a problem if you're small because it means more loud sound cancels each other out. So you're losing a lot of energy just to this acoustic sharp circuiting. So you can do a very clever trick and this is why uh, our speakers, when we have speakers at home in your hi-fi system are in a box, right? Uh, what happens is you can prevent that sound from meeting each other. You can say, oh, let's keep the high pressure and the low pressure separate from each other for as long as we can. And you can do that by creating what acoustic engineers call a baffle. So in, you just put a big thing around the sound radiation system and you, you just physically block off the two sound waves coming out of the system and prevent short circuiting. And that way you make a much louder sound. Now, our engineers came up with this was in the modern era, but it turns out that animals came up with it much longer time back. So, uh, you know, as, as somebody who wrote this, Eric Eaton wrote this lovely book, The Insects Did It First. This was true in the case of uh, baffles as well. So here is a tree cricket making itself a baffle in a, in a leaf, what they do basically is they cut themselves a small hole in a leaf, they stick their wings into that uh, and make themselves parallel to the surface of their leaf and they sing from it. And this makes them louder by preventing acoustic sharp circling. And essentially, if we go through our currently agreed upon criteria for defining whether this is a tool, uh, we find that yes, baffles qualify as a tool. Uh, and many, many, many tree crickets all over the world use a tool. And this kind of a tool, this is from China, I think, uh, suggests that they're manufacturing it, but they also have, they kind of make, use an environmental object as a tool as well without manufacturing. So, this is a fairly widespread behavior in tree crickets, right? It's not, uh, it's not just isolated in one or another species. Many, many species do it. And, you know, this is really cool because generally we think of tools as being something uh, fairly human, although there's very good evidence now that it's not human and perhaps even that it's not the most necessarily intelligent behavior in the world. It's just really exciting. So we want to go beyond just, oh, crickets make tools, and we want to ask 
a little bit more about this, right? We want to go back to the question that we started with. So are they really doing this because they want to make their mating system more efficient? They want to make themselves bigger and more conspicuous. So we're going to ask, uh, are they making not just a tool, but are they making the best possible tool they possibly can? And that's what we set out to answer. So what we did then was we convinced a few crickets to sing for us in front of a vibrometer. Uh, it sounds easier than it was. Uh, these things are always hard, but we managed to do it. We managed to measure uh, from the wings of a cricket uh, while it was singing. We had measurements of how much their wings were moving. We also made simultaneous move, uh, measurements of how much sound that motion of the wing was producing. And now we can kind of take it from uh, here into a much more sort of easier to deal with space, which is the space of physical models. So what we make now is a finite element model of a cricket singing in air. So that little piece in there is our cricket. We can put it in any shape and any size baffle that we want to. And we can ask how much sound does this cricket produce. And we can vary the conditions of the baffle, of how much, uh, how big it is, how small it is, how big the baffle hole is, how small the baffle hole is, and we can ask how much sound it produces. And what we can also do is we can say, you know, we can test our model. Our model is floating in free space. It can be tested against the data we've collected previously, which told us that this is the sort of level of sound that we expect this cricket to produce. And that is indeed what the model told us. So we found our measurements told us that the sound pressure level for the velocity these wings were producing is about 22.3 dB. And the model told us it's 24 dB, 25 dB. And that's a reasonable match to the data that we'd previously seen. So basically now what we can do is we can also ask what are the different baffles actual animals made and uh, what are the sizes of holes they made and look at what the sound levels will be with and without a baffle and different size baffles. So the main sort of like tool parameters that we thought about to begin with certainly is well, is a bigger leaf better? Is a smaller leaf better? And you can naturally think a bigger leaf will be better because uh, it'll prevent more acoustic short circuiting. Is a bigger hole better? Is a smaller hole better? Is there an optimal size? And we can do this in the model and we did, and these are the answers that we got from there. So basically what this plot is telling you is how efficient the animal is. So how much more sound it produces for the same amount of effort, uh, depending on this, basically the design of its tool, right? The size of leaf it chooses to make this tool in and the size of hole it makes in that tool. And what you see is that there's a sweet spot. There's a really nice place for these animals to make that tool in. So this is kind of what you hope animals will do. And then the next thing you obviously do, and this, uh, what we did for this research is ask whether uh, the animals pick this sweet spot. So there are two strange areas marked off in this plot. And the reason these areas are marked off is uh, this is the experiment we did. We offered them leaves in this size class and leaves in this size class, and we saw what they tried to do. So we gave them a small leaf, we gave them a large leaf, we released an animal, and let them decide what they wanted to do. They were very kind to us. They made baffles. Uh, 15 out of 19 males that we offered these two actually made baffles and all of them, every single one of them was smart enough to make them on the large leaf. So they knew that that's the size that's better for them than the smaller leaf. So here is a plot of all of the data. And you can see that the animals are pretty good at finding the sweet spot in this optimization function, right? They're pretty, they know what the right hole size to make is, they know what the right leaf size to make is. It's pretty cool. So these animals can make an optimal tool um, and they can do it in one shot, right? So these are not animals 
that are slowly making one change and then another change and then another change. Because you can only make a hole once. Once you've made it, it's there. Uh, and if you make a second hole, then you get more acoustic shards are getting a third hole, you get more, and fourth hole, you get more. So you're doing it in one shot, and you're, they're doing pretty well already. Except, obviously, they're animals, they're never perfect. Sometimes they go a bit wrong. So there's a little wrinkle in this uh, description that I gave you, which is, well, the assumption in the data that I, in the model certainly that I showed you before, is that that hole is in the center of the leaf. Now, the animal can make the hole wherever it wants. And indeed, this animal started by making a hole here. And the center of the leaf is not the same as the edge of the leaf. So as you go off to the edge, the amount of efficiency that you get from this tool is poorer and poorer. And we can, because we have the ability to model this, to actually measure how much poorer it is. And that's in that what we did. And we plotted where the animals were with respect to what they could do. So here would be ideal, but the animals are almost never exactly in the ideal spot, but they're very close. The interesting thing is they almost never go below about 10% loss above the ideal. So if you actually plot the best they could do, it's up here. What they actually do is here and what the small leaf would be, it's here. So they come to about 80% of 89% uh, best efficiency, which is pretty close to optimal, I would say. I mean, it's good enough for me. Uh, so yes, the males are definitely trying to be loud. They're trying to make themselves as conspicuous as possible. For them, for the males, it is important to be heard. Right? They're trying their very, very best to be as screamingly loud as possible. So this is where I switch the second part of my talk. And I start to ask the question, well, are the females cooperating with them or are they trying to make the males work as hard as possible? Um, so are the females sensitive to sound? And uh, what we used to know about crickets before we started all this work uh, was that basically, yes, their ears use resonance. So in the same way that the wings use resonance to produce sound, the ears use resonance to uh, set, to sense sound. So the same way the input over here is the coming in sound rather than the muscular effort the animal is making. And if the ear moves more, that's great because it's easier for the neurons that come downstream to actually sense that motion and therefore to sense the sound. So this was, you know, basically our main paradigm for thinking about these animals. And uh, it had been measured before. So we decided we would measure it in the tree crickets as well. There were other, there are some other uh, interesting wrinkles there that I'll come to in a few moments. So where are the ears of crickets? They're not like our ears. They don't have pinning. Uh, their ears have their eardrums exposed and they're on the basically the elbow, just below the elbow of the forelegs. So they're right here, they're actually big enough in these animals to see them by the naked eye, but if you do an SEM, that's what it looks like. They have two really large eardrums, the anterior tympanum, so the one in the front of the animal and the posterior tympanum, so the one in the back. And these are the things that we can measure from using the same laser Doppler vibrometer that I told you about. And this is what the motion of that eardrum looks like, right? Um, in response to the sound at the frequency that the male produces. So this is what that looks like. But you can do something a bit more. You can measure a lot of different frequencies uh, and you can look at per unit sound pressure, how much motion you're getting. And if it was a resonant system, like the tuning fork that I showed you, you should get a nice big peak somewhere in where the sound frequency is, right? Because you expect the air to be resonant to the sound frequency. And when we looked at the tree crickets, it was like, um, there's no peak. It's nothing. It's flat. This, most microphones aren't this good. Like, there's no preference for any, any sound. This is the first measurements we made. 
we were kind of like, oh my God, this is weird. Well, we did know at this point that tree crickets have this other unique property, which is that their song frequency changes with temperature. So our hypothesis was maybe it's like this because they want to equally listen to the cold song and the hot song, and maybe that's why they're flat. But being good biophysicists, we looked a little bit more carefully at this system, and we kind of wrote down some equations that should try capture this behavior. And we found that there was something funny about that. So what you have over here are basically, you're looking at the motion in terms of the amplitude of the motion, and you're looking at the motion in terms of, if you think about it, phase, in terms of synchrony. So when the sound is moving this way, is the eardrum moving this way, or is the eardrum moving the opposite direction? So how synchronized, or what way are these two things synchronized, basically, phase versus amplitude. And what we found was that when you write these equations down, we can get it to fit either in amplitude or in phase, never in both. What this suggests is there's something more to the system that we're not capturing yet. We're missing a piece of the puzzle. And it took us a very long time to finally fill in that missing piece of the puzzle. And the way we did that was uh, we found a second oscillator. What is that second oscillator? And you know, the way we did that is, is I made a mistake, basically. I did more experiments. And we could have stopped at the first one, but I didn't. I kept going. I did more things. And what I did was this was kind of the level at which we'd been measuring. So this sound pressure level was where we'd, 60 dB was where we'd been measuring the sound of, uh, measuring the motion of these areas of these crickets. I turned the volume down. It's not usually something we do because it gets harder to measure, but we've got a nice sensitive instrument, so I turned the volume down. There's something strange there. And then I turned it down some more. And there's something strange there. And I turned it down some more. And there's something strange there. So when you turn the volume down, there is a peak. So there is a resonance. And you turn the volume down, but not when the volume is high. Which means this cricket's air is tuned when the sound is really soft and not when the sound is really loud. So this is perfect if you think about it, because the further away an animal is singing from, the less its sound, song, the less volume its song will have at your position. So at that level, you want to be tuned to the sound, but when the animal is standing next to you and screaming at you, you don't want to be tuned to the sound because, well, you can hear it. The signal to noise ratio is pretty good. And this ear is doing exactly that. Now, the interesting thing about this is this is something that's well known from many, many systems. It's not unique to insects. Uh, it's actually known from our ears, human ears. And it's uh, one of the ways that we measure how good our ears are. So when your baby is tested for its hearing, when they're just born, infants before they can speak or respond, this is one of the ways we test uh, for whether their ears are fine. So this amplifier not only makes, turns up the gain on your system, it also occasionally turns the gain up so far that your ear makes a sound. So I, I'm presuming at some point or the other, everyone's heard that horrible squeak you get when your amplifier is too high and you speak into the microphone and the sound loops around the amplifier and you, you know, you basically get the screaming noise. It just keeps amplifying input, output, input, out, and you get the screaming noise. This happens in auditory systems sometimes, or a version of it. And the auditory system occasionally, when the gain's turned up too high, makes a sound. And you can measure this, especially, in, and we use that measurement to basically see if infants are hearing, whether their, air am their auditory amplifier works. It turns out that insects have it too. The first place that we saw this was in mosquitoes, and the second place that we saw it was in Drosophila. So this amplification system ex exists, but we don't really know what it's for. And that's 
some of the work that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so just really quickly, where is this amplifier? This amplifier is inside the air. That's the air again. Uh, and this is just to show you the anatomy of the air. So you remember that nice corrugated uh, tympanum membrane I show you, showed you. On the inside of it are these neurons, and it's these neurons that are the amplifier. They're the things that are turning the sound up, so to speak, in these ears. So we wanted to know what are these neurons hearing when it, they hear different sounds? So what we did next is uh, we measured from the nervous system of these animals what was happening when we played different sounds to it. So in crickets, the, this is sort of the nervous system of the crickets, a uh, schematic diagram of that. All of the neurons in the air send uh, excitatory connections to some uh, neurons in the uh, prethoracic pre ganglion. And we measured from this neuron that's very well characterized in crickets called the omega neuron one. We put an electrode into it and we measured how much that neuron was spiking when we played sounds to it. So just to walk you through these two plots over here, this is the blue shows you where the sound is on. This is the response of the neuron to that sound. The blue ones are when the cricket is cold. So remember I told you the frequency of this animal goes up when it's warm. So what's going on in the ears is what we're measuring over here. So what you see is when it's cold, the auditory system is responding best to a frequency at about three and a half kilohertz in this species, right? And when you turn the sound up, uh, when you turn the heat up, sorry, it's not responding to that frequency anymore. It's responding to a higher frequency. So the tuning, remember I showed you that my speak in the, that is shifting up in frequency with temperature. And so it, what's really nice is this lines up pretty well with what we know about a whole range of, uh, Cricket, tree crickets, which is that carrier frequency changes with temperature. So auditory tuning changing with temperature means the auditory system keeps up with the sound making system. And we can measure this sort of at a range of frequencies as I mentioned it before, but also at a range of uh, amplitudes. So we can turn the sound up and see what happens. Indeed, there's a peak uh, at the low frequency at the low temperature, high frequency at the high temperature. This is just to show you it's not one animal, it had been in a whole series of animals. And now we can draw what neurobiologists love drawing is these uh, response curves, right? Where you change your stimulus level and you look at what's going on at the neural level in response to that. And you can basically figure out where the threshold for the sound is. So what's the minimum sound at which you get a neural response? And this is beautiful because now you can compare the sensitivity of tree crickets to every other cricket out there because we've measured this for lots of crickets, right? So here is data at the low temperature. So what you've done over here is measure a range of amplitudes, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 dB at on peak and off peak. So you measure at both these frequencies, both at low temperature and at a high temperature, and you look at what is going on. So when you're on the peak, when you're at the frequency that that animal is interested in at that temperature, you see that you get a threshold of about 40 dB. Okay. And what's interesting about this is this is roughly the same threshold for sound that almost all insects have almost all crickets definitely have. So this animal isn't more sensitive to sound. It's about the same sensitivity as all the other crickets out there. So all the other crickets use resonance as a mechanism to become sensitive, and they achieve a sensitivity of about 40 dB. This cricket uses an amplifier to achieve the same sensitivity. They use too many different mechanisms to achieve the same sensitivity. But if they didn't have this amplification system, 
they wouldn't be able to keep sensitivity when the temperature changed, right? Because the male would shift its frequency up, it would be off peak, so to speak, and the female would be at the wrong place in the frequency domain. So what she's doing is using this amplification system not so much to make herself more sensitive, but to retain sensitivity no matter what the frequency is. So the females are doing something a little bit more subtle than the simple sort of picture that we planted about retaining sensitivity. So yes, mate finding is definitely a priority for them. The female is trying her very best to still listen to the male. She's not achieving anything more than any other cricket is, but she's retaining what she used to have. So the main function of the signaling system here is mate finding. The males are doing everything they can, including making a tool to be as loud as they possibly can. But they're also doing everything they can. The females are also doing everything they can to stay tuned to the males. Okay, that's it for me. And with that, I'll stop and acknowledge all of the people that I've worked with. It, I really, uh, nothing ever happens by one person. I've been saying, I have, I have. Really, it's all we have. And there's a huge number of people involved in all of this work and a huge range of uh, institutions. So a lot of the work was in collaboration uh, with my uh, alma mater, which is the Indian Institute of Science, Rohini, my PhD supervisor, and Rithik, who was uh, one of her PhD students after me, did a lot of work over here. Then I moved to Scarborough, where we did a lot of work. Uh, sorry, then I moved to Bristol, where we did a lot of work. Uh, where we also had a collaboration going, University of Toronto at Scarborough, where we did a lot of work. And now I have my own group uh, at Western, and we're going to continue doing a lot of this. A lot of different agencies have poured money into doing this, and I'm very grateful for their support. And yeah, we're doing lots of interesting stuff, including developing new methods to measure these things and exciting stuff to come. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Tasha, for your very, very interesting talk. Uh, the students were very curious and they started putting in questions just in the beginning. So maybe you have answered, already answered some of them, mm -hmm. but uh, I'll put forward those questions because they have put it and maybe uh, that needs some more elaboration on your sure. part. So the first question comes that uh, the crickets are nocturnal and they are used to live in the dark. Mm -hmm. Then why they are attracted to light? Oh, um, okay. So it's true that crickets are nocturnal, but it's not true all over the world. Uh, so here where it's temperate, and you know the hot season is pretty sharp. Crickets sing all day. It's mm -hmm. kind of uh, it's kind of annoying sometimes. Uh, that said, um, I don't know the answer to the question, so I don't know why crickets are attracted to the dark, <laughs> to the light. <laughs> and uh, the same student is asking another question. Uh, often the wings of these insects they get damaged. Mm -hmm. Does it interfere with sound production? Um, eventually it will, but uh, actually in that paper, we measured the resonance of the wing of a fairly damaged cricket and it was still very good. So they obviously have some uh, mechanisms to kind of still be pretty good, even with significant amount of damage. I don't know if I have the picture here, but if you look at one of those papers, the PNAS paper, there's a really beautiful picture in there. So they're resistant, but not perfect. Uh, another student, she asked rather two questions. I'm combining both of them. Mm -hmm. uh, she's saying that uh, if any kind of insect eats my plant leaves, uh -huh. I would try to kill it definitely. So is, isn't is uh, it uh, uh, logical by natural selection that uh, insect should shift to some other mechanism of sound production rather than getting killed with the help of insecticides? Right. Um, I mean, this is kind of a very multifaceted issue. Um, so they don't really eat the 
the leaf that they make the baffle in. I mean, obviously, if there was toxin on it, they would be exposed to it. So it's not like that's that's an answer to that. They would. So if we did spray those leaves, uh, they would be exposed to it. But they don't actually eat that thing. They cut out. They usually cut it out in one nice big piece and just throw it away because they're not interested in the leaf itself. They these guys are not a hundred percent sure, but they mainly seem to eat pollen from the flowers on that tree. Um, there are people who consider uh, tree crickets pests. So, you know, they do spray them. Uh, I try and argue with people like that and say, look at these animals, they make tools. They're amazing. Why would you want to kill them? Hopefully I convince some people. Uh, uh, we have a question from Swati Saxena. She's asking how the baffle system works in the case of social insects. Uh, right. So this is, might be something I bounced to him in there. Are there social insects that make sound? I don't know that oh, of any. That, that is true pheromones. Yeah. Uh, it, so, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. So the mating system in social insects is mostly based on pheromones. I don't think any of them produce some. The only place where something interesting may be going on, and I don't think the baffle system is involved there, uh, is the dance of honeybees. So the same way, um, I mean, the same way crickets are mostly in the dark, actually honeybees dance in the dark. So the platform on which they dance is actually inside the hive, and you know they're not actually seeing each other, although we see the nice videos of it. And uh, the communication in that case is actually not through the other bees watching this bee, but through the vibrations that this dance produces that the bees then set. And there's actually a lot of work there still to be done on how this vibration sensing works and how, but again, nothing to do with the baffle. Yeah. Uh, there are two questions from Harsimran. Uh, She's asking, do all sounds produced by insects serve for communication? Uh, some of, yes. I mean, communication in some form. Uh, depends on what one means by communication. So I'll give you an example that's kind of on the border. Uh, there are uh, moths that squeak and caterpillars that squeak really loudly at you when you try and catch them. And our understanding of what's going on there is that they are uh, trying to repel the predator. They're trying to scare the predator away. And whether that's communication or just a uh, aversive response is a question. But almost everything else has to do with communication, yes. And she's also asking whether the sound of a baffled cricket is much louder than the case of a non-baffled cricket? Yeah, uh, it is about 10 dB louder. Yeah. So 10, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have a question from Vaishali. She's asking, do some males, or in the case of some of the insects, use their louder sound to invite females for mating? Of course, uh, uh, it has been answered, I think. Uh, I should at this point point to a really beautiful study done by Ritik and Rohini that everyone should read about uh, this mating system issue. They just posted it on BioArchive as a preprint and uh, highly recommended that you read that okay. beautiful piece of work. And lastly, uh, the student is asking whether this baffle system is only to attract males or it serves some other purpose also? Uh, as far as we know, it's only to attract mates. There is, there is no known other purpose. They don't really stay on these baffles forever, for instance. That's not for hiding. Uh, there was a question, probably I missed it. Uh, the students were asking whether uh, they are nocturnal and how do they find the size of the leaf that this leaf is bigger and this is smaller? And how do they find which is the middle part of the leaf uh, to produce the hole there in the middle? It's such a good question. <laughs> it's such a good question because we don't know the answer, right? Uh, so, well, they have a few tools, right? They have these beautiful long antennae. 
and they could potentially touch both sides and see the sides. We don't know that they do it yet. Um, the other thing that's really sort of cool about this system uh, is if you look at those baffle holes, right? Uh, so I'll try and pull them up. Uh, in each case, you see that the animals make them right next to one of the veins on the leaf. And that's the, so that's, I think they can sense the vein again, using mechanical uh, methods and make their uh, hole next to it. But sometimes that obviously throws them off. They pick the wrong vein as the middle vein. But it also is why they never put their uh, holes dead center because cutting through the main vein is really difficult given that their mouth parts are not really cutting mouth parts. But it's a really good question. Yeah, there's another question has come in from Gurpeet. Uh, she's saying that uh, the female tree cricket is much more sensitive to low frequency of sound mm -hmm. generated by the males. So how come that the males are producing uh, loud sounds, isn't it just wastage of uh, energy, which is against natural laws? Uh, one way to think about it, right, is you're trying to be loud because you want to reach across distance. Remember, we talked about uh, making yourself as big as possible. So this graph, which the louder you are, the further your sound will go. So it's not just about reaching someone who's already next to you. It's about reaching someone who's really far away. But oh, she, you... she, she's saying that why not to produce uh, low sounds and attract uh, mates just in the vicinity? <laughs> well, because there might not be enough mates in the vicinity, right? Remember, we talked about the dilution. Effect. So thank you, Tasha, for... Uh, clearing these uh, questions which uh, the students posed. Now I'll request Dr. Party to finally thank the speaker and say the final words. Thank you, Natasha. It was a wonderful talk, quite interesting and engaging. And uh, I must acknowledge that in these crucial times, you spared time for our students and for this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And it was generally my pleasure to be able to speak to your students. I hope Thank they enjoyed it.